Hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer, and this is Strange Mosaic, and it is that once about every quarter special day where I don't have to get dressed up or put makeup on because Sophia Smallstorm is here to tickle our brains, and she doesn't do video, so neither do I today. Sophia, welcome back. It's lovely to spend the morning with you. Well, thank you, Emily. Um, it's nice to be back with you, and um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about a variety of things today. I think in the public segment, we're going to talk about your most recent newsletter. Um, but before we get into that, you and I were just chatting a little bit in the pre-show, and we decided that there was a topic we wanted to kind of put in front of that. Um, and that was sort of, I had some, some, I wanted to just chat with you for a few minutes and ask you a few questions about the way that you sort of assess information not get caught up in sort of cult of personality, how you iron out the contradictions in your own thinking based on, you know, confirmation bias and preference and things like that. Because I'm noticing um, right now, like in a really strong way, including in myself and, 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 you know, having this own, my own awareness about that I still do this sometimes that our need to um, like have someone be a hero or a villain, or the need to put our trust or faith in someone in other than ourselves necessarily, or this like weird thing that we do where like, if somebody says a thing that's true, but they've said something in the past that's false, we question their motives on every, like we get into all this mess where we're not um, assessing information just for what it is in any way. And where we're not constantly checking um, our own inner biases and the contradictions in our thinking. Like one thing, for example, is I see a lot of people who um, say they don't believe viruses exist, right? Which is fine to think that, but then at the second point, dude, they'll, they'll refer to how this very important virologist said that the pokeruni is bad and we should hold this person up because they're risking their career to say that, right? But if you're, if you're not believing in viruses, but you're praising a famous virologist, like, like that's confusing to me, right? Um, you know, and, and lots of other things like that. So I think you got the idea about what I'm talking about. And you have been in this space for a long time. You look at lots of complex topics um, and you are really good at assessing information and clarifying your thinking while always presenting sort of your own distinct style and the way you do it. I've known you for a long time now. I know there's researchers that you like, but I don't feel like you're someone who gets caught up in person in the cult of personality. And I know you've been on both sides of this where people love you for something you say, or, and then hate you for something else you say and blah, 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 blah. So I thought you'd be a good person to talk about with this a little bit, because I, I'm noticing it at like an ultra, like the all time high right now that this is really foggying up the, the, the scenery and preventing us from getting anywhere. Okay, well, Emily, as usual, this is a complex uh, set of jigsaw pieces you just threw at my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to pick my way through them. So first of all, we have language, right? Yeah. And we must use language properly in the sense that it can be understood by others and we're all talking about the same thing, right? Um, when I say the word square, we mean four sides to something that are the same length, right? Yep. So if we use the word virus, what is the context, you gave that example, in which we're using that word? We can have a virologist who studies viruses, and he comes out and says that the hokey pokey is not good for us. Mm -hmm. And he's not talking about a virus, he's talking about a poke. Mm -hmm. So we have to very carefully separate out all the terms and make sure we're talking about the same thing so that we can decide whether we agree or we disagree. Mm -hmm. okay? And then there's that whole part of us that wants stories. This is the oral tradition of passing on knowledge and history was all we had for a very long time. And 
people put history and happenings to song and the traveling bards came and they held everybody in rapture for hours while they strummed and danced and sang. Do you think that would happen today? No. <laughs> no. Nobody has a long enough attention span. And I'm so happy you said that because I just pulled up a, a publication. This is on PubMed. And where is it? Do you want, want to know what it's titled? Uh -huh. It's written by a Brit Anderson. And the title is There is No Such Thing as Attention. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She might be alone in thinking this, but I do follow some mainstream publications and many of them are bemoaning that our attention has been wrecked by scrolling, right? Mm -hmm. And then he cites the author of this particular essay that I have open here in paper form on my desk. He says, oh, but you know, now some psychologists don't believe there is any attention whatsoever. And he cited this article. So I looked it up. There is no such thing as attention. So if we don't have any attention, then how can it be ruined, right? right. If attention doesn't exist, then, then what's in crisis today? But um, yeah, we are used to being, to getting input that we build together and we decide that that is our body of knowledge or it's the basis for our belief. And mm -hmm. we get it in very different ways now than we once did. But mm -hmm. I think we still have built into us this desire for story, for beginning, middle and end. And sound bites don't satisfy that. Yeah. So we have to be able to have enough attention to create a story that is believable. And that applies to fact and that applies to fiction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to give you an example. It's very funny. I watched on the Turner Classic Movie Channel, The Barefoot Contessa. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's a gourmet store on Long Island somewhere called the same thing, The Barefoot Contessa. And I didn't know it was a movie with Humphrey Bogart and Ava Gardner. Have you seen this film? No, I, I'm well aware of Ina Garten, the chef who has the okay. Okay, gourmet market. But I didn't about Ina because this yeah. is we're talking Ava, Ava and Humphrey Bogart. And then uh, what is his name? Brazzi, Rosano Brazzi was the guy who played the count. So we go through two hours, two hours of trials and tribulations of Ava Gardner, who's a singer from Spain. And then she's brought into Hollywood by a director, Humphrey Bogart, and she stars in three movies. And then she has a crisis back in Spain with her family and she has to fly back there. And she stands trial on behalf of her dad and blah, 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 blah. And then she comes back to America and she doesn't want to be in films anymore. And she's kind of footloose and people accuse her of not being able to love because she has no man. And so she sets up with this kind of slimy South American uh, millionaire. And then he accuses her of uh, being a liar or whatever. And who should walk into this casino where she's having this stand down with this slimy millionaire, but this gorgeous Italian count. And he slaps the millionaire across the face, extends his hand to Ava, takes her off to his beautiful villa overlooking the Mediterranean where she frolics in the water. And then after several weeks, he decides he's going to marry her and she agrees because why would she say no she's got a mediterranean villa the ocean she doesn't have to work he's a gorgeous guy and on their wedding night he comes into the bedroom after the wedding and he tells her that he has to make a he has to tell her something and she says what and he gives her this piece of paper and he tells her to read it and that he can't tell her himself it's all on the piece of paper so she opens this paper which is in italian that she doesn't understand. And she says, this looks like a military document. He says, yes. He says, I suffered horrible injuries from an explosion in Benghazi, Libya, October 25th, 1942. And the doctors were able to put me back together. And you know that I love you with all my heart. And she said, yes. He said, you know, you know, I love you with all my heart. And she said, yes. And he said, but I can never make you happy. 
He said, every part of me was injured except my heart. And he walks out of the room. So what the hell happened to him, right? Yeah. We don't know. All we can think of is that his <clears throat> was blown off. And I'm thinking, how does he pee? <laughs> <laughs> this is the end of the movie. Base well, there's I'm not gonna tell you the final end. There's a little more left, but I'm I so I call up my friend and we talk about this, and I found on YouTube that scene, the count's confession, and I sent it to her and she watched it and she started laughing. She goes, Well, I mean, he obviously is missing a critical part. And I said, Yeah, but I mean, can't he why does he walk out of the bedroom? Why can't he figure out something else? I mean, you know, um, <laughs> Anyway, we couldn't understand it. And she said, I would love to have heard all the comments from the audience as they're filing out of the theater because we are never told. Right. We are never told what has happened to him. And um, anyway, so then I decide I'm going to post this on my blog. And I had talked to my friend maybe two or three times about this over two days. I go to look for this video of the Count's confession and it's the whole channel was pulled off YouTube. Oh, wow. Like, that, that, that's like, like, not like something that's recent. It's not. <laughs> I weird. know, 1954. And it's like, did AI hear that I was going to post this on my blog and I'm going to ask the world what happened to the count? Yeah, that's how it works, Sophia. <laughs> I don't know if that's how it works. But why did I bring all this up? Because the story has to be plausible. And this yep. story is not plausible. So maybe that's why they pulled it down, right? YouTube has suddenly had a reckoning that everything that's on its uh, on its platform must make sense, that it must be plausible, right? <laughs> but it's, who knows? Who knows? So if any listeners have watched The Barefoot Contest, I mean, it's a great film. Joseph Mankiewicz, he wrote the whole thing from soup to nuts. Um, but this part, excuse me, it's very hard to believe. Right. I can see a little child, you know, going, mommy, mommy, what happened to him? And mommy going, <clears throat> we can't talk about it. So it's a stupid, stupid denouement, stupid. And when you are looking at information, you have to apply your bullshit detector. Excuse me for swearing. Yeah. You have to put information together with all the rest that you know. You have to be humble enough to step down from a belief, a line of belief. Yeah. If this new discovery um, kind of flies in its face. And you have to be skillful enough to reconnect what you know to accommodate this new discovery. And it really means that, you know, you have to use your brain in a responsible way um, and a competent way, which are all skills that we are losing. Mm -hmm. Losing because people are used to, they're used to also taking sides and having arguments. And I always said, and I still do, that a lot of truth seekers are like hobbits. They want to go down to the pub, have a nail, argue, and wiggle their hairy toes. <laughs> Boy, the hairy toes. Um, hobbits had them. I know, right? So uh, a few more people than hobbits, dude. I see some people, uh, you know, so I see some, some gentlemen wearing uh, sandals or flip-flops with <laughs> <laughs> terrifying <laughs> toes. Um, but, but, right. So I think, th like, th there's all this stuff going on, right? And the first, like, you know, I guess the first thing that jumps out, like you know, that I want to sort of ask you about a little bit is this idea. And, and we've all caught ourselves doing this at some point, I imagine, imagine like that we have um, other researchers or information presenters or experts who we quote unquote trust, right? And f no matter how, um, you know, independent of a thinker you are or like how, you know, much time you spend pondering these issues, 
it's hard sometimes not to, even outside of your awareness, outsource a little bit of your thinking to someone who you trust, especially when the topic is complicated, right? right? And, um, you know, I think it's, we all have, you know, you know, we, I, one, one should hope that you have a certain level of trust in yourself and in the closest people around you who you are in relationship with. But most researchers, experts, information presenters aren't people we actually know, right? right. And you, know, you have like CNN, the most trusted source in news, right? Like, I don't know that we should necessarily trust people presenting information. Sure, over time, if, uh, if what you've learned from a person time and time again turns out to be, you know, right or the closest to right, you develop more of a, you develop some of that. But even still, like, you know, you never know unless you know a person really why they're doing what they're doing, what their motivation for doing what they're doing is, what their thoughts and opinions about other things are. And then that how it influences the way they may see whatever topic you're looking at at that point. So this idea that like, you know, oh, I trust this person, so I'm on their side. And I've literally been looking in the comment sections of some of the most well-known people in this whole what for whatever you believe about the nonsense the you know the pan, pandemic nonsense right people i literally see comments saying i have full faith and trust in so and so i you know what i mean and i'm disappointed or another person is like i've liked all your material but i'm disappointed that you don't like this other person who i like thing and so now i don't know what to think about you right mm. like it, it, it it's with a religious fervor to it well, maybe, Emily, the content has gone beyond the capacity of most ordinary hobbits to <laughs> deal with it, right? I mean, we have to take, for instance, Andy Kaufman mm -hmm. at his word if he says the COVID virus was never isolated, and this is why, because these um, protocols for isolation were never met. Okay, because we, most of us are not going to spend the hours that he spent and come up with the proof, the systematic proof that he has come up with because we don't have the attention right. <laughs> to do that, right? Right. We don't have the training to do that and we don't have the patience, we don't have, so we'll just say, we'll take what he says. He says that, okay, fine. And my main issue with where a lot of famous researchers have landed is that that is a small, piece of real estate uh, it's a small terrain it's like a postage stamp and I think we right. have to move on there's much more to talk about yes. for instance with this virus yes you know what there are viruses these viruses are as Kaufman pointed out they're also called exosomes that's one word for one particular type of um component, biological construction that cells release. Um, there are exosomes, there are endosomes, there are lysosomes, I and mean, there are all kinds of somes. But viruses and exosomes have been uh, identified as the same thing by Andy Kaufman. But then there are also viruses created in labs, not necessarily to release a pandemic or an epidemic or a disease, but these are components that they can actually program and put into yes. people's bodies. And that's what we're talking about today. Right. They, they're, they're more of something that performs a function, right? Yes. Like they use yes. to, 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 to do, you know, in its very similar ways that you, you know, you, with the computer, right. You can use it to perform a function. That function could be beneficial or not, not beneficial or just neutral. Right. Right. It, I mean, the viruses that the labs that virologists work with today in their labs are carrier agents, right. and they are designed to go back in the body to perform functions that they're expected to perform that cause certain changes or situations in that biological organism. I don't necessarily know that they cause, you know, immune protection. But they definitely are causal agents, and they have been created in labs out of biological tissues and other stuff, and they are being put into people's bodies. So this, these are the modern viruses. 
Right. So yeah, no, no, no. I I, I agree with you. I, I like I agree with you on, on that. What I'm just I just brought that up as an example because of how often I'll hear somebody in the same sentence applaud a famous virologist and say, I don't believe in viruses. Right. Well, that can but you see that is possible. You can still applaud somebody for something they have said. Correct. Correct. Right. But, um, but, but not, not like everything else they do. That, yes. And I'm glad you said that because if we, if we all, if we're learning to take information as like in its isolated form, instead of like, oh, well, this is the totality of what this person has said. If someone says a true statement, it's true, no matter who said it. Right. If someone said like the sky is blue, let's, I, I'm sure there's no people who are arguing with me about that, right? Then regardless of a person, if a person who lies about everything else said it, it's still a true statement, right? <clears throat> However, you know, like, th- so I agree with you about that. If someone says something true, it's true no matter what else they've said. That doesn't mean that truth can't be weaponized and all of that kind of stuff. However, do what I wonder about is, um, you know, if people examine within themselves, okay, like this idea, but you know, okay, um, we're applauding this person, this person is a hero. I don't, I don't know that just stating something that is true makes you a hero, first of all. No. Right. And why would somebody who's famous saying something that is true make them more of a hero than you or me or anyone else saying something that is true? We have to stop doing that. Right. But also, does the person ever have a question in their head if they're like, oh, I love this person. Oh, you know, they're, they're, you know, this person is so smart. They're a famous virologist. Right? Do they ever ask themselves, well, it's weird. I'm so in awe of a famous virologist when I also don't believe that viruses exist. I'm, I'm just talking about these inner inventories and working out the contradictions. Right. That doesn't mean that the famous virologist can't say things that are true. Right. But I, I don't see I see sometimes some of the strangest cobbling togethers of um, like what people say that they believe or who they like or who they trust, right? And you also see it in like a lot of these conferences, right? Where like the conferences are about, you know, it's unclear sometimes what they're even about, but like ostensibly it's like we're trying to expose the truth. Mm -hmm. And you will have two presenters who basically are saying things that not, aren't just slight differences or opinion, two separate presenters saying things that are diametrically opposed. And if one is true, the other wouldn't seem to be able to be with no discussion about that, right? Like, and it keeps yeah. a level of thinking from advance. I think it's okay to have people at the same conference that, that have disagreements and maybe live in completely different informational worlds. But if you're presenting both things and you're saying this is a conference about, you know, getting to the bottom of this, finding the truth, then wouldn't it make sense that those two people who disagree at least have a conversation so you can watch how they reason that out with each other, as opposed to just, oh, this person's telling the truth and they say this, and this person said the opposite thing, and they're also telling the truth, right? Like, I think we have to advance, like, our level here in terms of, I'm ironing out these possible inconsistencies, these possible contradictions. And sometimes it can be, you know, sometimes multiple realities and truths can sort of coexist, right? But I think like everybody's always kept at level one based on this like not very good examination of like our own inner thought process. And then this desire, tendency, need, or just thing we keep doing as far as like, you know, outsourcing our thinking, putting, you know, faith and trust in someone we don't know as though they're, you know, some sacred saint or something like that. And then this this other thing of like the hero or the villain, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm going to actually mention something here because I know that I've often wondered, but I try to understand, like there was a very famous vaccine researcher Mm -hmm. Uh, anti-vax person Sherry Tenpenny Mm -hmm. Dr. Sherry Tenpenny and she says in almost every interview that she has spent 40,000 hours or maybe more now that she's put a lot of time into this COVID vaccine thing studying vaccines and their effects now she believes fully in viruses Mm -hmm. and I have moved beyond the virus as a disease causing agent belief but i understand that she has a lot at stake here she's got books about you know h1n1 and um i don't see a person who's put that much of their career into uh 
something founded on the existence of the thing, the virus as a disease causing agent, I don't see that person changing their right. position quickly, or if at all, ever. Right. And so truth, as I see it, is a big picture. It's an expanding picture. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, I mean, look, I'm like not very well known. I certainly don't have thousands of followers on Facebook and Instagram and stuff like this. And I am who I am. And I, I try to move along because the Rolling Stone gathers the most education. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we have to keep rolling. We have to keep rolling. But there are people um, like Andy Kaufman, like Sherry Tenpenny, who have the same position. They keep that position. They talk about the same thing. And we can always refer back to them. We can refer other people. Oh, look, go, look, go look at the, the exposés Andy Kaufman has done. He's a doctor. Okay, so that's helpful, right? And then people say, but he's a psychiatrist. It's different. And yeah, it's different, but he still has a degree of training and methodology that the rest of the hobbits don't have. So they need him. Right. Right? Yeah. No, no. I mean, you know, like the, the thing about Andy Kaufman that, that I think is interesting, right, is that he really has been very disciplined about sticking to what staying staying in his lane really and sticking to what he has said and not getting caught up in um like uh, muddying his waters just because like somebody who disagrees with him about everybody else agrees with him that when you know this is all nonsense right he's been very disciplined in the way he approaches what he um you know what he speaks about and how he speaks about it Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, people can agree with him or not agree with him, but he's not doing schizophrenic stuff. No, he's not. And right. he he serves as a um, you could say an expert having done a very methodical study. So we can go to his work and point other people to his work. Right. And that's a good thing. But right. what's happened and we can move into the discussion of my newsletter. Yes. I was horrified, horrified to find out what is happening with TikTok. I had right. no idea. I mean, I had heard the word TikTok. I figured it was some kind of little platform, not little, big, but for short stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, like Instagram or something. But it is a video um, software provider. It allows the most, you know, basic, even a child person to make a very nice, uh, I guess you could say professional looking video with music. And the they have um, they have the potential to go viral these videos, and then you can become a TikTok influencer. I mean, all these things I learned by reading an article in Har Harper's magazine. But the most appalling part of it was that all these young teens who even have admissions and you know sports scholarships to significantly impressive universities are giving up college. Not that I'm saying college is what you need and college will give you an education that you can then use to make lots of money and become a respectable citizen of society. I'm not saying that. These kids are going to live in these mansions that are called TikTok mansions, and they're funded by investors. And the investors take a portion of what these kids earn from their TikTok videos, which is astronomical. If you ha are a TikTok influencer and you make a successful video and it goes viral, and if you're good looking, in particular, you have to have some kind of cachet, some kind of you know personality or, or looks, then companies will go to the TikTok uh, marketplace, creator marketplace, and they'll trawl through it for young kids who can boost sales of their products by making these dippy, and I mean dippy, and they're worse than dippy. It's like gyrating pelvises, dry humping, as one researcher called it, who went to stay at a TikTok mansion and to observe how these young guys um, behave and what they're doing with their lives. And it's staggering because they all have 
zero attention span, zero. Yet they think that brainstorming on how to make the next super duper video that will go viral and earn them, I mean, their earnings can be in excess of 50,000 a month if they get chosen by companies, brands to push products and everybody's competing for this. And so these earnings, you know, blow away what a regular college grad would make if they just did the usual thing and tromped out there looking for a job. So if you can make 50, 60, 70,000 a month and you can live in a huge, you know, 10,000 square foot mansion in Beverly Hills and an investor will take 20% of what you earn and you can have hot tubs and girls and when you walk into Walmart, everybody falls at your feet because they recognize you from TikTok. This is the new world. So, okay. So there's a lot of stuff that this, um, that this sort of brings up, right? And the first thing that when I started reading your newsletter and, and started, uh, you know, they got to this part, because there was some other interesting stuff too that I hope to get to in regards to, to Amazon. But when I started reading the TikTok part, um, first of all, like I refuse to download TikTok I've seen TikTok videos that people send me before, but I don't have the app. I will not have the app. Um, you know, like to me, I don't, that way of consuming information, um, I just don't like it, right? Like I prefer, I don't necessarily need everything to be long form. There was a time when I only liked long form, like two hour videos or interviews. I don't need that. Like now, you know, maybe like, you know, it can be a little shorter and stuff, but just literally a minute or two or something like that, um, that doesn't do anything for me. And that goes back to earlier in our conversation about storytelling, right? And the need for a beginning, a middle and end in context, right? And, you know, no matter how much Adderall or methamphetamine you're on, I don't think you can go through anything fast enough to give a beginning, a middle and end in context in a minute and a half or however long those videos are allowed to be. Um, so, so that doesn't appeal to me, but when when you started to explain these houses and that the people don't actually pay to live in the house they just you know give over a portion of their you know returns on tiktok and you know did you ever were you ever familiar with this television series that was very very popular in the late 90s and into the early mid 2000s called the real world on mtv no mm -mm. all right so what this did was it brought you know six or seven or eight you know, interesting looking or fairly good looking or whatever people from all over the country, all over the world to a city. Um, and they would all live in a house together and for a couple of months and sort of sometimes the it included that they had to have a job. Other times it didn't, it depended on what, what city they were in. And it changed over time because the series was on for like 20 seasons or something, right? But they were all living together in a house and, you know, having their adventure in whatever this city or location. Sometimes it was more of like a beachy kind of location for a number of months, right? But they were getting to live in a big fancy house and, you know, have cameras there all the time. And, and then they, these people would have a certain degree of fame after that experience. Obviously, the whole thing would be shot before it started to air. And then, you know, after that, these people would be recognized on the street. And sometimes later, there'd be a reunion or they would started having these like competitions where like, you know, that, that people from the various seasons would do like athletic or survivor kind of competitions against each other. But essentially these people became famous for either nothing or for just doing, you know, like doing silly stuff. Like it was the longer form version of what you're talking about, right? Like the episodes for real world or whatever were, you know, 30 minutes or an hour long, right? But it was same, basically the same idea. You have all these young kids, you know, living together in a house, doing things that they would never normally do in their regular life if they weren't put in this position, right? So it reminded me of that. Um, and then, you know, listening to the conversation between the journalist who was there and some of these kids, and there seemed to be one kid with the level of awareness of how ridiculous this was, but it didn't stop them from, from participating in it. And my favorite was when you described or where you, I can't, no, I don't know if this was your description or just a, a quote from the article about this guy and girl who um, did a, you know, an ad for raising canes or they made a video that yes. was sponsored by mm -hmm. raising canes of them eating from different ends of the chicken tender and then kissing in the middle. 
right? And how long they spent to come up with this idea. And I was like, well, I saw that when I was like five in Lady and the Tramp when the two dogs eat the same noodle and kiss. Remember that scene? Did you ever no, see? I, I didn't see Lady. But yes, OK, I take your word for it. Right. So this was like a, one of the iconic sort of Disney cartoon movies, um, probably on the edge of where they went from just like partially full of subliminal messaging and Satanism to, to, <laughs> to more deeply into it. Right. It was like in the seven, late 70s or early 80s. It was one of my, it was my favorite when I was little. I remember my grandma took me to see it. And that was my favorite scene when the two dogs got the same spaghetti noodle and kissed. Right. And, and, and I loved that. Um, and so like this uh, idea that, um, that a, that that's a unique idea, but the reason that that scene was, was the favorite was because of the entirety of the story around it. Right. The part that came before the part that came after and all the fleshing out of the characters. And, and so like that, movie that brought me joy and I still remember to this day like in some ways has been like reduced down to this stupid thing that you're talking about <laughs> yes but you know what Emily here's I'm going to um tell you this I'll read the quote from the Harper's article which was by Baron I need to we need to give him credit um, Har Barrett Swanson, June 2021. He was a college Eng English professor, professor who visited this content house. They're called content houses, these TikTok yes. mansions. Terrifying. And yes. he got to stay there and interview the boys. And I mean, they're all young, you know, loutish lads, very well meaning, but not very, um, I don't know how to say it, present in, uh, in, not with high working intellect, let's say. Right. So the boys are aware, I'm reading from my newsletter now, that society's standard is us as being the chosen ones, as being good looking kids, as being the new entertainment. Mm -hmm. And thus everything you post has to be likable, which means you must spend many hours a day thinking about what that is, which is very hard work, harder than a job. <laughs> From our yeah. journalist. Now, oh, this is a direct quote. When I ask the boys to describe the amount of money they receive from brands, they use words like absurd and absolutely ridiculous. Christopher just did a TikTok video for a West Coast chicken franchise called Raising Canes, for which he and his girlfriend were paid $74,000. They each start munching on one end of a chicken tender until they meet in the middle for a kiss. I didn't know what a tender was. It's a piece of chicken, but whatever. So I put piece of chicken. <laughs> they meet in the middle for a kiss. Now, just let me interrupt here. That's the story, Emily. The I beginning know. is each end of the chicken piece, the middle is nibbling your way to the center, and the end is the kiss. There's, there, there's the story, beginning, <laughs> middle, end, <laughs> and it takes 10 seconds. So about this brand deal, Christopher says, I'm obviously grateful, but like, yo, this is a 10 second video, and you want to give me how much money? So then I wrote, who would say no? And I quoted Chris again. I feel like I'm a walking museum, bro. Like when we go to the mall, people are just staring at us. I feel like I'm literally a walking art piece. <laughs> oh, Sophia, we live in the world with this situation. It's, you know, like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, so what's scary, though, is their perceptions are right. Like that is what's happening. Yeah, that's the art. And let me let me add on here. So then this is adorable. The boys say to the professor, do you want to be in a TikTok? And he's unsure his university might not take too kindly to a video of one of their professors dry humping for TikTok viewers. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, but this candid hand wringing elicits only squealing guffaws from these kids who are kind of delighting in the prospect of my professional demise and keep enjoining me to just do it. So mm -hmm. now here's the reality. I had no idea. Pro college professors are making TikTok videos because their tenure depends on student appreciation. Yep. So 
Our journalist, a professor himself, tells us that there's this Chris Sutherland, who's a professor at USC, mm -hmm. top school, University of Southern California. He's got 2 million followers on TikTok and his own line of hoodies and t-shirts. And so our journalist asks, how long before universities get their own influencer mansions with professors made to compete for students' attention, blending course material with sad TikTok dances? I think it's closer than people would think. I know. And I'm telling you, in this other attention article that I was reading, they have what's, what they have called deep attention. Educators whose courses are designed for deep attention. So now, what you and I had to do as children just to make it to the next grade level mm -hmm. is called deep attention. <laughs> <laughs> this requires complex application of thought processes and the actual, you know, effort to retain information. So I have a good friend whom I love dearly, who inhales videos all day long. I mean, anytime I call him up and I go, hey, did you see that video on blah, 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 you know, about blah, blah, blah. He'll go, yeah, yeah, I saw that one. And did you see this one? And he'll send me videos. I'll send him videos. Sometimes he tells me I must see such and such video. And I say to him, and these are not 10 second videos. This is, we're both doing this for the content. And when I ask him, what was that about? He goes, oh, I can't remember. Well, he says, so-and-so's interview and so-and-so was really good. And I say, well, what was it about? I can't remember. So this is, you know, attention that doesn't result in retention. Yes. So it, it, this to me goes really like, it's hand in hand with um, online learning Right. And, you know, this problem, I think this is a clearly created problem where uh, the kids have been home learning and the parents are frustrated because they can't get the kid to pay attention or to do their work. Forget about the fact that, you know, the quality of the education online is not the same or whatever. Right. The parent, the kids there, they're not doing their homework or they're not paying attention to the class either because they can't sit still or if they can sit still, they're on the side on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever and not really paying attention. And this is where the solution is going to be. Right. We have the thesis. We have the antithesis. The solution is going to be the gamification and the, token, the tokenizing of education so that the kids are getting all of their learning from video games right, that are not designed for deep learning or deep attention, but are more designed for like memorizing the way through the, the maze or whatever, right? This is going to be how they offer to, to mediate that problem, right? And then it rolls us into, you know, the Allison McDowell situation, right? Um, and you've seen that there. I, I, I listened to... Um, something where the guy was basically saying they're creating video games that by the time the kid is able to pass the video game, they will have achieved graduation from that course or passed that course, right? Mm -hmm. um, so these things kind of go together. The other part that you talked about that was so interesting was this idea that everything must be likable. Likable right? and authentic. Uh, so and not offensive to anybody, completely right. political, void of any kind of opinion, right? Yet still authentic. Well, uh, the authenticity is a display of what would otherwise be regarded as super private. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, bathroom selfies. Right. Because if, even... because if you can't express an opinion about anything, the only way then to be sort of authentic or revealing in any way would be what you're talking about. Yes. Right. And this yeah. guy who wrote this article said, he says, after all, these kids were very young when their parents gave them iPhones and tablets. They've never even known a self that wasn't su subject to anonymous virtual observation. So that's one thing that, you know, you take a picture of yourself as soon as you wake up and you post it or send it to a friend. And these kids, these 13 year olds are sending like nudie selfies and whatnot. Right. But right. there's also, so that invasion of privacy, that ready, 
you know, uh, giving up your privacy, that's considered authenticity. And that's right. very, very squarely, I think, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is when you download the TikTok app, it is what I call a Pied Piper app. It yep. roves through your phone. It pulls all kinds of data on you. And within instance, a profile, a digital sampling of you, a broad one, I would assess, uh, assume is, is assessed and put up um, on the TikTok platform for their use. And then they start serving up everything you love because they've already gone through your phone and they know so much about you. Yeah. So this was the other part I was going to talk to you about this with. I don't know if you remember, but at a certain point, and I just pulled it up so I could get exact on the dates, there was this idea that Donald Trump was going to ban TikTok from the United States. Do you remember this? Uh, I don't remember, but I I have been um, aware of that now since I've been looking into TikTok. Yes. OK, so I remember when that was going on that he said he was going to ban it and then like suddenly it wasn't banned. And the way that it got to the not being banned was that like they bite bite dance who owns TikTok, like agreed to, to some kind of separation that would it would sort of seem to make it that it wasn't owned by like having to do with the Chinese government. But really, that didn't happen. And it, it just they created like a shell kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but this was a big thing, like, you know, in that year, like this, this was going on right before and then in the early months of the the vi the pandemic stuff right yes. and this yes. was in some like like here's just if, if you and again you know that wikipedia isn't a wonderful source but you get an idea from it sometimes right the background is uh in 20, january 2019 an investigation by american think tank peterson institute for international economics described tiktok as a huawei sized problem right that posed a threat to national a national security threat right so then in, in on july 7th 2020 uh, Mike Pompeo announced that the government was considering banning TikTok, right? In response, experts suggested that Trump's proposed TikTok ban may threaten free speech and set a very problematic precedent for banning apps in the United States, right? And then, you know, basically uh, later that month, Trump announced a decision ordering China's ByteDance to divest ownership of the application and has threatened to shut down its U.S. operations uh, it, you know, basically, if the company doesn't comply, and then there was this thing that kind of looks like a faux compliance, and and, and there we have it. Um, but it, you know, it 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 is interesting. In uh, you know, I learned from you, and I wasn't aware of this before that um, TikTok is not available in China. Not the same one. It's called right. Douyin, and it is all about accomplishments and achievements, and it's very kind of you know straight. And right. not not kinky and dry humping and uh, pop based like this TikTok is that they have in the rest of the world. But what I w thought was extremely important was that this goes back to the opium wars, all right? Mm -hmm. And TikTok, I put a video on my blog, which is sophiasmallstorm.com. And I think this is now on my 2021 archive. So if you go to sophiasmallstorm.com, go to the 2021 blog and look for the video, TikTok is worse than you thought. All right. It's a okay. half hour video, very interesting. But it is called in that video by the narrator, a degeneracy weapon. Yeah. China's degeneracy weapon against the West. And so I'm just going to read from my newsletter because my April newsletter talked about the East India Company. And what we're seeing in these tech companies, like these big, huge platforms like Google, Facebook, Amazon, TikTok, these are IT giants, more powerful than any government, with more money than any government. I mean, TikTok spent billions, billions of dollars um, three million per day to promote uh, ByteDance, excuse me, the owner of TikTok spent three million per day to promote this teeny bopper app in America. So I'm going to read, China is a country and ByteDance is a Chinese company. China is a country that dates back to ancient times. We recall that the British East India Company ruthlessly ran opium grown by force in Bengal into this part of the Orient, destroying Chinese production and morale so as to 
correct the trade imbalance that existed. Because what was happening was China was selling porcelain and silks and whatnot to the West. And they were actually, there was more desire for Chinese goods by the West than for Western goods by China. So this was considered a trade imbalance. And so this, you know, criminal East India Company started to force the Indians of Bengal to stop growing food and start growing opium poppies. And then they ran the opium. This was the first international drug running way back, way back in the 1800s. And they ran this um, opium into China. And then it was popularized by Protestant missionaries who were agents of the British East India Company popularized and they addicted everybody in China from the coolie worker level up through the aristocracy. Um, they addicted them all to opium and this softened China. It ruined their productivity. It ruined the social um, organization of China. They became opium addicts. So payback has arrived. China's downfall by opium addiction through its creation of TikTok is being avenged. TikTok tools were de deliberately engineered to create addictive, pleasurable content designed to infiltrate neurology and steal the energy of the world. So says a video I posted on my 2021 blog, TikTok is worse than you thought. If we want a high quality future, says the narrator, we must reject our low quality present. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's true. Right. And this, you know, in some kind of weird ways blends with, you know, the ideas you've presented as humans being used as sort of, you know, batteries, you know, or whatnot. It's a slightly different take on that. Right. But literally, like, you know, a battery can have its energy energy drained. Right. And that's sort of what's being talked about here. But I will say that, um, you know, I don't know too many people that are that into TikTok or if they are, they're not making me aware of it. I think it's something that's just mostly in a different age group, but I do know a few, right? And them there, I would agree that you, that I have seen uh, some behavioral change in some of them, right? That is kind of like when somebody gets addicted to gaming or when somebody, you know, starts, uh, you know, I've done plenty of drugs in my life. So I've known lots of people, you know, who were not doing drugs and then they're doing drugs and you start to observe certain changes, right? That it definitely is operating on that same sort of system, right? Um, and it's, you know, like it's, it's I, don't, I don't think that's deniable. Well, here's the danger, Emily. So I met a couple, they are both very serious filmmakers documentary one already co-produced a short that won an academy award now that's big okay and we're not talking satanic movies or anything we're talking documentary shorts so one of them had already been part of an oscar winning team the other one's documentary short is now shortlisted for the oscars so these are America's finest filmmakers. And they were both addicted to TikTok, they told me. And they're not 20. Wow. And they told me it was because of this. This is the claim that TikTok makes. And it's in slightly stilted English. When consumer use the app, consumers do not need to put their preference. AI will automatically get a sizable database of the consumer's behaviors. So these two extremely talented filmmakers told me that everything they were given by TikTok was amazing. It was right, exactly what they were looking for in terms of information, more information, more information, more information. Mm -hmm. And then they went to see a movie when the whole COVID restriction lifted, right? Because it was during COVID that they were watching TikTok all the time. Mm -hmm. And so they go to a real movie in the theater and the wife in this couple told me, I couldn't pay attention. I couldn't follow the movie. And she said, I just kept having intrusive thoughts. My, my mind kept wandering. And that's when she realized TikTok had ruined her process of, of, of understanding something. Uh-huh. And so she quit. Yeah. 
So it is China's brilliant degeneracy weapon. It is, by the way, banned in India by the government and the Pentagon on all US government devices. And American military parents are urged by the Pentagon not to let their children watch TikTok because it's going to waste your brain. Yep. So that's what I found very interesting. And of course, you know, I call this the hollow world. Yeah. Yeah. So whether this was planned, I wrote in my newsletter, the lockdowns made our children lonely and suicidal, but TikTok, the virtual babysitter, brought them laughter and community. Yeah. So are, are we going to allow something from outside to shape us? Or will we try to sh make ourselves the best we can be from the inside? I mean, I think that's the question. I mean, that goes to the, the earlier part of our conversation as well. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that is a question. Since you uh, mentioned the British East Indies, uh, in, uh, British East, East India, India. Uh, I wanted to not let this segment end without touching on the portion of your newsletter that was about Amazon Ooh, and what yes. they're doing, because Amazon is definitely today's British East Indies, you know, India company. Um, you know, I've suspected something like this, but like, it's one of those things that like, you don't necessarily say out loud because it sounds paranoid, right? Yeah. Um, but you want to tell people like kind of what you're, uh, you know, what you sort of discovered about about Amazon and, and then we can chat about that for a little bit. Should um, I start with my water bottle experience? Sure, please. Yeah. Oh, my God. So here I am. I found this beautiful little, it was pint size. It was for kids. Stainless steel water bottle made by Clean Canteen. And it was exactly enough for a few hours out and about. It wasn't a big one. I loved it. I took very good care of it. I didn't let it get scratched or anything. Then one day, I had had it for about a year. <gasps> I left it at the pool under my chair. I walked away without my baba. <laughs> <laughs> and I wake up the next morning at like 5 a.m. And I said, oh, my water bottle. Oh, my God. I left it at the pool. What am I going to do? I must have it. I must have it. So I jumped in my car at the crack of dawn, went racing up to the pool. I was there. I mean, there were the big lights shining. This is all outdoors. There was fog over the two pools and here I am I, I said no no I'm not here to swim I need, I need to look for my water bottle and it was gone it, was, it wasn't in the lost and found it wasn't under the chair and I went oh my baba is gone what am I gonna do so I went racing home I got online and I saw it on Amazon oh there it is I picked it out put it in my cart went to check out and I noticed my checkout price was one thousand dollars and I thought, what? What? How? What? One thousand dollars? How's that? So I went back to the item, and yeah, it was one thousand dollars. I said, oh, this is not possible. I don't see how. So I deleted it from my cart, put it in my cart again, but it was one thousand dollars. So I said, okay, I'm not buying it. <laughs> good, good choice, Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was a little bit depressed because I needed that water bottle, that size with a little green cap. And a few days later, I went on Amazon again and it was there and it was only like $17. That's what I had paid for it originally. So I bought it and I got away with it for $17. But then I found out in Harper's again, this is September 2020, an article titled The Big Tech Extortion Racket that these companies, Uber is one, mm -hmm. Amazon is another, they're gonna charge you based on your shopping analytics, which they have, they're gonna charge you the maximum they think you will pay. So if I tell you, Emily, I got this wonderful pair of sneakers on Amazon. Oh, they're so cool. You love the colors. You should go and get, get some. And you go to buy them, you're not gonna pay the same price that I paid necessarily. They will charge you the maximum that they think you're going to pay. And I was quite horrified finding this out. So it's interesting because what happened to you implies to me, not just that in terms of like, okay, they've looked at one's past spending habits and where they're living and blah, blah, blah. But it seems to me that there was an attack on your emotional state. 
when somebody is in a fran- is frantic because they have lost something and they don't know if they can get it again and then they found it, they feel so relieved they either a may not pay attention to the price, you know, which you which you mentioned in your newsletter, or b they may gladly overpay because they're just so glad that they that they got it. Now, um, $1,000 is ridiculous. I think anybody who noticed that price in their cart, you know, unless they're a TikTok celebrity who, you know, is making $50,000 a month for eating a piece of chicken, you know, they may just be like, why not? $1,000 seems right in the world we live in. But most people would say no to that. But had they just prayed, you know, like, and so you got in some ways lucky because it, it went to the extreme. But let's just say that they had said that the body, the bottle was $40, in your emotional state, maybe you would have agreed to it. Now, what's weird about this to me and that other people who don't know you might not recognize is that you're not a person that runs around with a cell phone attached to the internet on you. Right, right. You have an old school cell phone that you only turn on to actually make a phone call or receive it. It is well, not. It's, it's not even on me. It's not even in the house. It's in the garage. Right. And it, But it's not a smartphone. You don't buy things on it. You don't search the internet on it. Right. And so you're you have not given that no, much right. data to that. Right. And so whatever was going on there was, um, you know, th- th- is disturbing on, on a bunch of other levels, like almost on like the surveillance. And like, was there a CCTV near the pool that saw you leave your water bottle and, you know, facial? I mean, like, I'm not going to go like way, way, way out there into person of person of interest territory. But like that was really extreme. Um, and, and, and for, and a person who, you know, doesn't give away any more information to the board than they absolutely have to, as I know you are. Right. Um, but you know, I've suspected, I mean, the thing with Uber, I I've suspected that because it's like crazy how sometimes the ride from here to there is $8. And then uh, the next time it's like $40 and, Okay, you can say it's rush hour, but it doesn't seem to be rush hour. And, you know, this is weird kind of thing. And sometimes I feel like they um, also try to ding people who don't like I I don't leave the GPS thing on for any longer than I have to. Right. Kind of thing. Like they seem to, you know, if you're not a person who will let them munch on your information, then they're going to ding you some other way. But, you know, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but um, the Amazon thing is interesting. And, it, you know, of course, I mean, if we're talking about there's going to be social credit scores and tokenized behavior, why wouldn't that be part of it as well? Right. right. And Emily, there's one more explanation, which is that, well, either it was a pure glitch, but that's one explanation. But then the other one is that it was listed at $1,000 just in case, you know, people put all kinds of stuff in their cart and they mm-hmm. leave it there. And then they check out and they're not looking at what each thing cost. And so right. maybe they thought I would just mindlessly check out and then I get my credit card statement. And I know there are people who owe thousands of dollars on their credit card and they just make a certain payment every month. And maybe they thought, oh, she's never going to notice that we charged her a thousand dollars for a water bottle. I don't know. So there, there's that possibility. But yes, how? because I literally, I woke up at dawn and I went, oh, my bottle, oh my God. And I pictured myself, I had put it under my chair because there was a bit of sun and I didn't want it to get warm. And so I left it under the chair, I didn't notice it. So I don't know, I don't know how it knew to charge me that much, but it was a bit much, as you said. Had it been $25, twenty four ninety five dollars instead of sixteen fifty or whatever I paid, I might've paid it to another 10 bucks, right? Right. Because I really wanted it. Um, So I don't know. It's very interesting. But what I commented on is that we are going to end up, I'll read the paragraph from my newsletter. What is particularly spooky about all this is the realization that data has become the key to your life and you are being gradually moved into a narrow tunnel built just for you in which all commercial transactions of your life shall be presented to you with specific terms and prices all figured out for you, designed to squeeze every last penny and every drop of soul from you as the network funds and feeds and enriches itself. This becomes your life determined by data. My price is not your price, and your destiny can be directed as well. 
right? So we can be popularized, we can be disappeared. And the term for this, and we have all experienced this in our community, is personalized discrimination. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, that and then the other thing, and I've noticed this several times, right? So like there can be an author, uh, like, especially if you're dealing with an alternative topic, let's say, right? That writes a book and eh, maybe when it comes out, it gets some attention, right? And, um, you know, whatever, that person kind of disappears from the scene. Nobody really knows what happened to them. Maybe they died, but maybe probably not even that they died. And then their book somehow somebody mentions their book several years later, right? In a bigger podcast or something like that. And suddenly everybody is diving for that book, right? Mm -hmm. That nobody was buying before. And so all of a sudden when there's uh, something like, okay, there's been no action for the algorithm for this book in seven years. And today there was 40 searches, mm -hmm. right? Then what you're talking about kicks into high gear, especially, you know, they're, they're very well aware of what goes on in the podcasting world and the cults of information and whatever. If somebody has implied that maybe there's a secret to figuring out the reality or something like that available in this book, and you've got everybody who just listened to such podcasts now searching for that book online, right? And trying to buy it and thinking, oh, they go there and it's like, oh, there's only one left or two left and it's really, really expensive, but I better get it because there's only one or two left. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you wait a week or two, there's plenty of books again at the normal price. Yes. And, 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 you know, I'm sure this happens in other communities besides just the alternative information community. I'm sure it happens, you know, whatever pet topic people like these algorithms have figured this out. And so our own desire not to miss out on something, not to be left out, not to be the one person that doesn't get the answer or doesn't get to find God or whatever the fuck it is. Right. Um, you know, keeps us um, bound to to this. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, we're at the mercy in this very strange web of an existence that we live in, which is so uh, organized by data and we're so dependent on that organization mm -hmm. um, we are we're going to have to really hold out and we're going to have to say no uh, you know stridently to certain things if we don't want to be completely ruined and taken advantage of yeah. and this is the whole concept of the parasite um, you know we we live in a world which is parasitic, the arrangement, the architecture of the society. And, you know, in biology, it's often, I read uh, once that the concept of we are the hosts for quadrillion bacteria and organisms, micro microorganisms. So who's ruling them or us? They are hosted by us. They live in our body, on our body. They perform a lot of functions for us they do our digestion, they really do regulate our health in many ways. And we are dependent on their balance to be helpful, because if we get out of balance, you know, and one type of bacteria morphs into another or whatever, then we can become very ill. We can become ill by from their waste products, if there are too many of them in eating certain parts of us, which they do, they're waste, they're garbage men of the body. So who's in control? And now our society is like that too. Our society is this, you know, there's a symbiosis between us and the, the Borg that most people can't carve the Borg out of their lives. Right. Yeah. It's just gonna be very hard to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's a good point. Like so many of us out of one side of our mouth, say Amazon is the portal to hell and out of the other side of our mouth, yell to our sweetheart, oh, when you next time you do an Amazon order, will you remember to get me this? Right. right. And, and there is something to be said for sitting in one place and not having to drive around. I mean, since COVID, the stores got very empty. Yeah. And I'm not going to go to t five different stores to find whatever, you know. Yeah. It's going to and gas. In California, so expensive now. Right. So you have to say to yourself, okay, how do I exist without the Borg? It's going to become rather difficult. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think these are all uh, 
Good points. All right, let's do this. Let's let's wrap up the first segment here. We're going to move over into the, the patrons hour where we're going to um, we're going to talk about some of the um, sort of uh, media or topics uh, that Sophia has been looking at lately that aren't necessarily in her newsletter or her unique original thoughts, um, but things that she thinks are uh, sort of important because I've been taking a look at some of them as well. Uh, we're going to start definitely, we're definitely going to talk a little bit about uh, Clifford Carnicom and maybe one or two other things. So you, if you would like to join us for that segment, uh, patreon.com forward slash off planet media or emilymoyer.locals.com. Before we leave the public though, Sophia, let them know where they can find you and how, how they can support you. And, and I think that all of your items are not available on the Borg. Um, and so uh, they'll be supporting independence uh, from the Amazon mind control algorithm by supporting you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my uh, blog page is Sophia with an F smallstorm.com. And that's a sub page of my old, much older website about the sky. So you'll be redirected. But all you have to do is type in Sophia, S-O-F-I-A, smallstorm.com. And um, you can subscribe to my newsletter. There's a little icon on the side that tells you how to do that. That goes out by snail mail. And I do shows occasionally on my newsletters, but not on every newsletter. So if you want to hear what's in every newsletter or no, you would have to subscribe. But anyway, so there's that. And then there's my online store, Avatar, A-V-A-T-A-R. And this has nothing to do with the computer avatars. Avatarproducts.com. So I really enjoy the fact that I can present things that I use that are made by friends of mine. These are all people just like us. And, um, you know, now's a good time to get the Sherpa bed warmer. You should look at what is a bed warmer on my store, and that enables you to turn the heat down. It's not electrified. You'll be really warm at night and cozy, and there are plenty in stock. All right. I'm hoping that in the summer you might have a bed cooler. That might be a little more up my... <laughs> <laughs> there is some kind of bed um, that I saw advertised. It's, it's the Arctic bed or something. And Ooh. I don't know, it's got to be electrified, but it, the ad showed all kinds of icy waves coming off it. You have to go on Amazon and see if it's there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we will see you on the other side. Be right back. <laughs> 